mini-series of Teshuvah. We've had various weeks uh, discussing the subject of Teshuvah, the different uh, aspects of Teshuvah. And tonight will be about the Teshuvah revolution that will occur in the days right before Mashiach comes, which is the generation that we're living in. A very, very special time. A time that has never existed before. Not only, not only talking about the materialism and the standard of living, but in what will be happening to the Jewish people, positively. So that is what we will be talking about tonight. Bezat Hashem, the next two weeks we will be off for the Haga Sukkot holiday. Coming back after Sukkot, there may be one more lecture about something which I, I will decide after the holiday, after which Bezat Hashem will be beginning a new series, something uh, that we did about nine years ago, the 70 most difficult questions in Judaism. But it will be slightly different, it will be more elaborated, there may be more questions, so you know, I'm still in the process of preparing that, but that may be the next series, Bezat Hashem, after the Hag. The Rambam brings down in the Chot Teshuvah that Kol Nevim Kulam Tzivul HaTeshuvah, all the prophets talk about Teshuvah, they instructed Am Yisrael to do Teshuvah, they continuously reminded us about Teshuvah. Ven Yisrael Nigalin Ela Betshuvah, the redemption of Am Yisrael depends on the Jewish people returning to Hashem. And then he adds a very important point. Uchvar Ifticha at Torah, the Torah already promised. Shesof Yisrael La'asot Teshuvah, in the end of days, you will see that Am Yisrael will do Teshuvah. At least a good number of them. The Sof Galutan, at the very end of the Galut, Umiyad Nigalin. And in the heels of that Teshuvah, there will be redeemed. Sheneemar Vayaki Yavu Alecha Kol Advarim Veshavta Hashem Elokecha Veshav Hashem Elokecha. In other words, when the when the Galut will intensify, Am Yisrael will do Teshuvah, and after we do Teshuvah and return to Hashem, Hashem will return to us, and that is what will bring about the Geulah. That is something that we are experiencing today, and there are many stories, fascinating stories that every Baal Teshuvah can tell you about how it came to be that he decided to do Teshuvah. And we can talk a whole night just about stories, but uh, there's no need for that because you can find them printed in printed form. There are many good books, good stories on how they, uh, they did Teshuvah, how they came to this very difficult decision. And I mention difficult because it is not easy. One of the greatest difficulties that Jews will have in the end of days before Mashiach comes, whether they're religious or not, whether they need to do Teshuvah or not, will be Nisyonot. Challenges. They will be tested. Their emunah will be tested. Something that was so obvious to the Jews I mean, years ago will not be so obvious anymore. Not that they won't believe at all necessarily, but they will believe that they will be tempted. There will be a lot of temptations. And what happens when there are temptations? One's faith is challenged. And when I say one's faith, I don't necessarily mean his emunah in Elohim. Even his observance as a Jew will be tested. And why will there be a lot more testing now than before? Because of something called Berur. Hashem will make a final Berur. He will filter out the Erev Rav. Those Jews that are amongst us that are really not from the same root of our souls. From the same Shoresh and Neshama. They're called the Erev Rav. They're amongst us ever since we left Egypt. They converted. And as a result of their conversion back then, they are mingled, they have mingled amongst us. But they don't behave as Jews, they don't have the same attitude towards Judaism. And there are ways that you can recognize them. And believe it or not, what may shock you is that many of these Erev Rav are religious. Religious Jews too can be Erev Rav. There can even be rabbis who have Erev Rav in them. But what makes them Erev Rav is not something so dis- easily discernible that you can tell. You really have to look into an individual's life and examine for one to be able to determine if one is that. We don't have that kind of a, a system that we can determine, but some will stand out much more than others. They are the ones that are obvious today, trying to give away Yerushalayim, trying to give away portions of Eretz Yisrael. They don't really have atta- an attachment to the land or to its people. They don't have any feelings, or they don't have the same feelings that we have, you know, when we see another Jew in pain. Pains us. If you are pained when another Jew is in pain, that's a very good sign. If not, that's a terrible sign. Yeah? How do you how do you know they said Nasev and Ishma? All the Jews, they all were as one. All the, the, the majority said Nasev and Ishma. 
It doesn't, it doesn't say that every single individual said Naseh Nishma. The majority said Naseh Nishma, and as a result of the majority, the Jewish people, you know, received the Torah. Amongst the nations of the world, the Midrash says that they were offered the Torah. Even though it's more allegoric, it doesn't mean Hashem actually went to them, but he was prepared to give the Torah to other nations. You think everyone said no? There were Yishmaelites that said, okay, I'm interested. The problem is the majority of you people are not. So according to one opinion, the minority who did want to are the ones who convert in future generations. So we're not talking about every individual in any nation. So there are many fascinating stories of how each individual has come back to the fold. And I will share with you one story that you may have heard from me, but it's a fascinating story. And it, is, it, it happens during a time that Russian Jewry is awakening. Russian Jewry awakened, especially when the gates of Russia became open. You know, the communism was weakening, and therefore the Jewish people were not as persecuted, and there was a tremendous aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. Today there's over a million Russian Jews in Israel, just Russian. Some have come and gone, but many have come and have made their home in Israel. Many of them have done Teshuvah. So I'm going to share with you a fascinating story of a Russian Jew who was a total atheist, total non-believer. This, is, this story occurs in the early 80s, I believe, because he made Aliyah in the mid or late 80s. So we know the story because of all the Russian Jews that came to Israel. He had a very good friend, this non-believer, also Jewish. His friend was very much a believer. And right now, they're about to part. They're about to go each one in a different way because the one who was a non-believer was drafted to go to fight in Afghanistan. Remember the time the Russians invaded Afghanistan? And this non-believer is going to go to Afghanistan. The, the observant Jew is going somewhere else. And before they part, the believer tells the non-believer, just remember, whenever you are be'et sarah, you're in a difficult time, you're having trouble, you're in danger, just pray to God. I know you don't believe, but just remember that. If you turn to him and you're in trouble, he will come to your help. And that is how they parted. This non-believer had a hobby. He was a zoologist. He loved animals. So the first thing he did when he arrived in Afghanistan, he went to search for the cobras. There are many snakes there, but not just ordinary snakes. Cobras, dangerous snakes, poisonous snakes. But he was a zoologist and he went looking for them. And sure enough, he found the holes. He found one hole where he was staying close by and he put some food. And sure enough, the cobra came out. And over time, he became friends with the cobra. With the food, the cobra would come, and they got to know each other after a while. Remember, they were there for a number of years. So anyway, one day, his mefaket, I guess his, uh, his commander, came and told him, you know, we're leaving, pack your bags, we're, we're going. So he tells his commander, you know what, can I ask you a favor? Before we go, can I go say goodbye to my friend, you know, the cobra? He says, okay, I will make it fast, because we need to leave. So he went, and his usual routine... He went to the hole, he put some food out, the cobra came out, but all of a sudden, the cobra stood up. Now, I don't know how much you know about snakes and cobras, but he knew, he was a zoologist, and he knew what that meant. When the cobra stood up like that, it means that you don't move. Because any small movement you make, they're very fast, and they can bite, and the bite of a cobra, if it's not treated almost on the spot, it's fatal. They're very, very, very poisonous. And he understood. He was, of course, very, very shocked because this is his friend. By the way, snakes don't make good friends. Yeah. Don't take them as pets. They're unpredictable. So uh, he's frozen. He doesn't move. So he figured, okay, he'll wait. An hour went by and the cobra is still standing straight. An hour? That's very unusual. Two hours went by and the cobra is still standing where it is. Now, after two hours in the heat of Afghanistan, he's almost dehydrated. He's, he's in terrible pain. Here his friends are, have probably left already. He doesn't know what to do. Three hours went by, and only after three hours, the cobra went back into its hole. Now, three hours is a long time. What do you think he did during those three hours? You know, it gives you a lot of time to think. Pray. He prayed. The God of my friend, if you exist, <laughs> you know, please help me out of this situation. He never saw something like this. He didn't understand what was going on. It was very unusual. So he prayed to this guy he did not know. And after three hours, three hours, imagine a snake standing there for three hours, only then did the snake go back into the hole. As soon as that happened, of course, he ran. Ran as fast as he can. But his friends were gone. What do you do now? You follow 
the tracks of the heavy equipment of the Nagmashim. How do you say that in English? Of all the, you know, the tanks and all those heavy equipment that leave tracks. And that's what he did. He followed and eventually he caught up to his friends, but they were all butchered. They had been ambushed by the Mujahideen. Remember the Mujahideen? They were all killed. They were all dead. He just realized what had happened. He just understood why he was held up. Had he not been held up for three full hours, he would have had the same fate as his friends. It was to him a miracle, even though he did not believe in miracles. He did not at the time believe in God, but he understood this was unusual. He never saw Cobra stand like that for three hours. Why hold him back? All the days it didn't hold him back. Perhaps weeks or months, it never held him back. Now it held him back and for three hours, now he sees everybody butchered. All you need is a little bit of common sense, a little bit of sechel, and even the greatest atheist hopefully will come to the conclusion that there was a miracle. And once he realized that there was something unusual here, his friend had told him that there was a God, he had prayed to this God, when he made Aliyah, he of course investigated this further in the yeshiva, the Hazar Shuvah, and he did complete the Shuvah. One story, one example of an individual who came back, coming from a background which is completely atheist. We're not talking about a Moroccan or Yemenite Jew, who if he's secular, his father or grandfather were very, very religious. The gap by the Sephardic Jews is only one generation, the most, one and a half, two. That's it. We're talking about a, a Jew growing up in Russia where you may have three generations or more of nituk, of a complete distance, detachment from Judaism. For him to come back to something he never was introduced to is amazing. But that does not happen on its own. Obviously, this is the generation of Mashiach, and Hashem is helping everybody do Teshuvah, whoever wants to. What's necessary? What's necessary is pithuli petach shel machat. Pithuli petach shel machat, the rabbi says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, all you need to do is open me a small hole the size of a pin. And I will open it up as wide as the entrance to a hallway, to a big hallway. Hashem says, I want you to just make a small hole, make a small opening, make a small commitment, and I will do the rest. The problem is, not everybody is even thinking of making a small hole. Why not? The Torah tells us, You were shown. It was demonstrated to you beyond any doubt that Hashem is Elohim. You were shown. You did not receive this by tradition. We're talking about the generation that was in Matan Torah. If they said Nasev and Ishma, they were convinced. And not only were they convinced, they committed themselves for their children and future generations too. Everybody after us is signed in. Is signed on this agreement. That's a big commitment. They must have seen something. They were not crazy. They were very stubborn people. If anybody would refuse, it was the Jews. But they obviously experienced something real. Atahor Eta. When Moshe Rabbeinu says Atahor Eta, you were shown, it was demonstrated to you. What he really means is that to every Jew, without any exceptions, they show, in Hashemayim, on his level, that Hashem is Elohim. If he searches, if he searches, if he pays attention, then he will realize that there are miracles happening every single day. Many, many Jews have asked me, secular Jews, God would only show me a miracle, of course I would do Teshuvah. But that's foolish. First of all, it's only an excuse. It's only an excuse when they say that. Because whoever really wants to believe does not mean miracles. Whoever does not want to believe, even if you show him all the miracles in the world, he will attribute it to nature or something else. So the show me a miracle is just an excuse. It's a silly excuse. Because if you really want a miracle, you can see miracles every day. Every day we are shown miracles. Life is a miracle. So if one were to act, if one were to behave like Abraham Avinu, the first Jew, that on his own as a child, against all his people that lived around him, Defied, defied all the, the standards and what was accepted then went against it said I want the truth I want to discover it on my own if one would have that attitude he would discover the truth you have to have the attitude of Abraham Avinu and that is to search for the truth but not everybody is interested in that you know why? because truth is very heavy once you discover the truth it requires or it demands commitment it demands that one of course follow the Torah not everybody is comfortable doing that they would rather do what they want so that's why a lot of people are hesitant and they come up with all sorts of, of excuses. The, the Gemara says that Mashiach will come besechadat. Besechadat means that people will be distracted, they will be at work, and all of a sudden they will hear it on CBS, on KNX, on CNN. You believe it, even CNN will broadcast it, even them, that Mashiach has come. What do you mean? They are distracted, they will have to hear it from someone else. What do you mean distracted? Mashiach will come when everybody is distracted by something else? I, I once asked a question on the Gemara. The, Gemara, the same Gemara elsewhere says 
that there are so many simanim, so many signs that you can recognize Mashiach is coming. It will be so unexpected when people will be so distracted they won't even realize it. It will be unexpected. Rabbis compare it to Mitziat Aveda. It's like you're finding a gold watch in the street. Do you expect to find something like that? It comes unexpected. Or to the bite of the scorpion. Do people expect to see a scorpion? Before you know it, you're bitten. Where did that come from? It's a scorpion. Scorpion bites without you seeing it first. The commentators explain why is the coming of Mashiach compared to finding a lost object or, find, or getting bit by a scorpion. The two things are very opposite. The bite of a scorpion is something not too, too pleasant. Finding a lost object, finding something precious is pleasant. Well, it depends for who. For those who are waiting for Mashiach, it will be something pleasant. For those who are not waiting for him, it's going to be like the bite of a scorpion. It's going to really bite them. They're going to really feel bad. But what will happen to everyone is that it will be unexpected. Why is it unexpected? There's so many simanim, because they're not looking. If you're asleep, if you're not paying attention to all the signs that are happening in the world, of course it will be unexpected. But I think most of you realize that what is happening today in our generation are all signs of Mashiach, especially if you know what the prophets say, if you know what the Gemara says, you know what the signs are. You see them in the news, you see them. You, we're living through this. I mean, the, the greatest sign of all is that a third of all Jews, besides the ten tribes, are in Israel already. That's called Kibbutz Galuyot. I mean, if you were living a hundred years ago and I were to tell you Mashiach is around the corner, you would ask me to prove it. It would be hard to prove. How many Jews were in Israel in 1900? 8,000. 8 to 10,000 maximum in the year 1900. In the year 1948, 600,000 Jews were in Israel. Today, Rosh Hashanah, 5767, I think it's 5.3, something like that. Jews, not counting the Arabs, not counting the Christians. Of course, they're never counted. You know, they're not included here in the count. And this is the number of Jews that are living in Israel already, besides the Jews living in America and South America. So what do we have? If we have about 15 million of known Jews, that's a third. A third of all Jews are already in Israel? People are sleeping if they don't understand that this is Kibbutz Galio. What else do you call that? Five million just decided to move there? They haven't done that for close to 2,000 years. So we're definitely in the middle, in the Zat Hashem, towards the end of this process called Geula Redemption. However, people are asleep, people are distracted, therefore they don't see it. They don't read the signs. And what will happen to these people who don't read the signs? The same thing that happens to you when you go to the holiday with the hills, and you go into a street, you've never been there, and all of a sudden it says dead end. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that somewhere. Dead end. What should you have? What should you have done? Had you seen the sign on the entrance to that street, what would it have said? Not a throughway street. Remember that? There is a sign before, a half a block before. Not a throughway street. Don't go here. You won't be able to go on. But some people don't read the signs. And in the end, they will reach a dead end. You know why I call it a dead end? Because a lot of Jews will do teshuvah when they realize that all the money in the world does not bring them happiness that this is not the direction they should be going on, something is missing in their life. A lot of Jews will do Teshuvah, they will feel a certain emptiness. Talk about successful people, lots of mula. You know, what, you know what that is? Lots of money. Green stuff, real estate, stocks. But they will realize that this is kalam fadi, you know, like we say in Arabic, empty words, nothing, emptiness, shtuyot, nonsense. That's a dead end. They will realize, hey, maybe I should go to meditate in the Himalayas. And that's what some Israelis do. After they finish fighting for three years in the Israeli army, they have to, uh, you know, look for something. Something is missing. <laughs> so a lot is missing. You know, they're still not married, most of them. So a lot is missing in their life. And they go to the Himalayas, they go to South America, they lo go look for something. And then many of the gurus send them back. They send the gurus themselves, send them back to Israel. All that I know, I learned from you guys. You learned from us? Yeah. You have the Torah. You mean it's in my backyard? Yeah, what do you have to come to India? It's in your own backyard. So many Israelis are discovering the truth, not in Israel, but far away from Israel. But at least they discover it. How do they discover it? They've come to a dead end. They're looking for some spirituality. Their lives are empty. They have everything they want, materialistically. They thought they have everything. And eventually they see they're, they're missing something. So some people do Teshuvah after coming to a dead end. Another individual will do Teshuvah, but Sarlecha, like the Rambam brings, the Torah says that many Jews actually will do Teshuvah because they will have a difficult time. Life will be tough. Economically, they will not be doing well. They won't know why. Why is everybody else doing well and I'm not doing well? What has happened to me? And they will do Teshuvah. They will realize that perhaps this is Minash a sign that they better do something. Now, I, I, I should add something, that there's a lot of people who do Teshuvah 
And only after they have begun to do Teshuvah, that is when economically they suffer. You know, here they were doing well for many years, and Dafka, after they do Teshuvah, all of a sudden things go down. And they don't understand what's going on. Wait a minute, does Hashem love me? I'm doing everything He wants now. I'm much better than I was before. Then why should I suffer now? I'm losing all my customers. What happened? They don't realize that now Kadosh Baruch Hu loves Him. And because He loves Him, He wants to atone for His sins. Atones for His sins, He would rather touch His finances and not touch his physical body. In the end, we all need a kapara. I mean, Teshuvah is very powerful. It's very necessary. But sometimes, depending on what individual did during his life, he might need a kapara. What's Yom Kippur? Kippur is a necessity. It's, it's like the laundry mat. you got to remove the stains. There are stains to the soul, to the neshama. We need Kippur. But Kippur only takes care of certain stains. The ones that are very, very embedded, oil stains, for example, I don't think the laundry mat or the cleaners can help you with oil stains. It's, you know, it's there. So what do you do? You know, you get yourself a new suit. I mean, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of course, rubs off our stains for certain Abonot and Yom Kippur together with Teshuvah. Without Teshuvah, Kippur will not help at all. Kippur helps, but sometimes Yisurim, in the form of pain and disease, what they all have in common is that they help cleanse a person, especially if he accepts it by Ahava. With an understanding that this is Nashamaim, I accept it, it's coming to me. Gamzul Tova, it's all for the good. Then the Yisurim are Mechaper as well, the pain helps to atone. So there will be individuals who are pure, complete Valet Teshuvah, who will be experiencing Yisurim, only because Hashem says, you know what, I'd rather clean you up now than upstairs. I love you, I care for you. You're a true Valet Teshuvah, let me take care of it for now. So the next three, four, or five years, depending on the Heshbon and Mala upstairs, he will have a hard time economically or some other problems. It's all kaparat abonot. But otherwise, there will be people who will have a hard time even before the Tutashuvah because that is an ot, a shamayim, a sign that they should wake up. They don't wake up in any other way on their own, so Hashem has to hit them over the head. But tsar lecha, unfortunately, Israelis today have to be hit with missiles. For some it helps and some it doesn't help because they don't understand that what they're doing is not right. There's something wrong with what they're doing. So the enemies have to remind them. What do you think the enemy is for? An enemy is created as a whip. That's what the Navi says. O Yashur Shevet Api. Ashur, Assyria was the whip of Hashem's anger. Hashem has to use nations. He used Ashur. He used Ammon. He used Plishtim. He used all the nations around Israel during the time that the Jews were in Israel before the Bet HaMikdash and after, during the Bet HaMikdash, just to remind them that what they're doing is wrong. Something is wrong. The rain would not come down. Hashem used all sorts of means to remind them that what they're doing is not right. So some Jews will be hit over the head. Something will happen to them before they do Teshuvah in order to push them, to encourage them to do Teshuvah. Those who get the message will be blessed, of course, will be fortunate. As I've explained in the past, we are in a situation where the standard of living is higher than it was 50 years ago. So if somebody was accustomed to a high standard of living and all of a sudden he drops... It's very painful. If you were poor all along, and now you're miserable, which is even worse than poor, then okay, the difference is very small maybe. But to be rich, I'm sure some of you here, if not all of you, know of an individual who once upon a time was very wealthy, and today he's not at all. He's not at all. I mean, he's really barely making it, struggling, and maybe even begging. Okay. I lost six million dollars in one day. Six million? And, what, and how long did it take you to make the six million? Six years, seven years. Yeah? And you lost it in one day, wiped out. They yeah. no in Yeah. No insurance. Yeah. But Baruch Hashem, it was only money and not nefashot. That's the way we were supposed to look at it. I noticed that each time that I was involved with something not very kosher. Uh huh. And when I was in the book, I ate not kosher. Right. Make it be right. And then I Yeah. All those whose neshama is from a holy source, or whose family is very special, then of course Hashem makpida lem yoter, Hashem is much more strict with them, and lets them know immediately on the spot, not a, not a week later, on the spot you're told that what you just did. So you're lucky. In the last four months, four cars were stolen from the same location. Four? Four cars. Cars, yeah. Kaparat avonot, everything is a kapara. Yeah. But anyway, it's not only important, it's not, it's not enough to say kapara. One has to, Rabbi tells us, when you see many things happening to you, lefashpesh, the maasim, you have to examine yourself and ask yourself, why? Maybe there's something I can do to correct it, to prevent it in the future. You don't just want to get hit and not do something about it. 
It could be a kapara for a long kishbon, but it also could be leorer tadam, to awaken him up, to examine himself. Another individual will do teshuvah because of tchadim, because of fears. He will be shocked, he will be in fear because of all the earthquakes or tsunamis or events that will happen during his lifetime, during his generation. And uh, as a result of that, people will be you know, awakened. It doesn't mean they will do teshuvah as a direct result of that, but they will go to a seminar, they will be, it will begin their process to find out, to investigate. What did we say before? Petach shel machat? All they did was, it got them to go to a class. It got them to listen to a tape. People used to give them a tape before, they just threw it in the garbage. Now, they're in shock. They say, let me hear. See what I mean? So sometimes, what will happen is, they will open up a small little hole. They will not be completely immersed into it. But that small little hole eventually will widen up. And... And then, in the, towards the very, very end, right before Mashiach comes, there will be many Jews who will really be threatened, who will be in fear of what is to come as a result of wars, or imminent wars, like Iran, according to our tradition, in the Gemara and in the Midrash, and also I think in the Zohar, that they will be a major threat, either a terrorist threat, or a uh, threat of embargo, oil embargo, or nuclear, that some people suspect, and that we see today that they, that they would like to get their hands on that. Regardless of, of, of what it is and in which direction it goes, they will be a major player. And they're very close, too close to, for comfort to, to Israel. You know, and if these people cause problems all over, happens, there will be many, many Jews who will do Teshuvah. But why wait for that? That's called Teshuvah Mi'ira, not Teshuvah Mi'ahava. The ideal Teshuvah should come out of love, out of recognizing that this is the truth. That this is what my parents and grandparents gave their lives for. If it was good enough for them, why isn't it good enough for anybody? Am I smarter than them? Right? So there are many reasons, of course, that we've explained it all along, that people are hesitating or have a hard time doing teshuvah. It could be arrogance, it could be the comfort that they don't want to give up, but it could also be something else. That's what I want to talk about at this time. There are individuals out there who are complete atheists. Like the scientists who say, I've already made up my mind, don't confuse me with the facts. That's, the, that's a hard nut, a hard shell. Yeah, and I feel sorry for them. He does not have an open mind. Then you have an individual who's not an atheist, he's called an agnostic in English. He says in Hebrew, you know, convince me and I will, you know, okay. Please come to a seminar, to Arachim, or to the other seminars all over the world. And you will be convinced. Many of these seminars are so well presented and well organized with the emit that anybody who has an open mind comes out admiring his religion. And hopefully through the admiration that he has, that will lead to the next step, to further investigate it. And he will want to fulfill it, of course. When you admire something, you respect it, you investigate it, then you will want to do what, what your parents used to do. So some people will, will of course, do teshuvah after realizing that there is no other address to turn to, no bush, no nobody else. But that is already a Teshuvah Mira. Avraham Avinu set the example of what a Jew should do, and that is to search for the truth, just for the sake of finding out the truth, not because you're afraid. But what did we say before? Jews are distracted. Many Jews are, unfortunately, either bordering atheists, but I would prefer to say many, most of them are agnostics. But now let's take somebody who's not an agnostic. Let's take somebody who is traditional. You know, we have a lot of traditional Jews today, something that did not exist years ago. You were either observant or you were not observant. Masorati, traditional, didn't exist. What about them? They have to be very, very careful, this group of traditionalists, for many things. But one of the things they have to be careful is not to set up walls. What is a wall? It's very easy for somebody who can, who's, who can easily do Teshuvah because the tradition is in his home to delay it. In other words, he's traditionalist, so he understands it. He's thinking about it, perhaps. He's heard it in the radio, he's heard the tape. But he still will not do complete teshuva. Why? First, let me get married. First, let me finish the army. First, let me make a couple million dollars. I'm going to travel to America after I finish the army. Many Israelis say that. Make some money, and then I'll think about teshuva. In other words, what are they really telling you? That they believe in this stuff. They believe it. It's true. They just they don't want it yet. They're hesitating, they want to push it out. This pushing off business is a big danger to many, many Jews. Yeah? I have some people uh, claim that uh, I'm embarrassed to do change for Shuba. Right, that's right. See, 
Because of the Hebra, the friends, what they will say, sure, that's a big problem. As I said earlier, there are many Nisyonot, there are many tests and many challenges. But let Teshuvah have many challenges, many hardships. Anyway, a very fascinating prophecy that we will be witness to and we already are seeing today is what Malachi says towards the end, that one of the, one of the signs that Mashiach is coming is not only Teshuvah, what kind of Teshuvah, how will it come about? Veshiv lev avot al banim, velev banim al avotam. Parents bringing the sons, sons bringing their parents. Beautiful. Children bringing back the parents with Shuvah. That's not something you've never seen before. Never. When you see that, you know Mashiach is around the corner. You know that that is a clear sign of the Geula. I once asked, but why? Why should it be like that? Why should it be that the children should bring back the parents? Anybody want to suggest anything? I mean, children bringing back the parents? Why not the parents do the Shuvah and bring back their kids? Why would it it's going to have to be the other way around? I think the Chazonish, Zechit Tzadik Levracha, said that all the tears that our grandma, uh, grandparents and great-grandparents shed for their children and grandchildren to be Jewish, to remain Jewish, did not go to waste. Yeshno Otsar Lemala, there is a treasure house upstairs where Shem stores all these tears. And it is through those tears that will awaken the grandchildren and future generations to bring back their parents, to bring themselves back. What? I think it's called Kostakarela. The, 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 the Kostakarela is food. Yeah, there's a Yeah. So the children will therefore come back as a tremendous Siyua Melemala through divine help, through the tears that were shed many, many generations ago. But it, if you look at it more simplistically, what's happening is that many, many parents were detached from Judaism either because they grew up in the kibbutz or they just did not grow up with Jewish tradition because of they, where they were. And the kids are happening to grow up in a better environment that's more conducive to Torah and therefore they will bring back the parents. That's, a, that's also, I mean, the fact, something that we're seeing. There's a story that happened in Israel about 20 years ago or so. There was a non-religious boy that became friends with a religious boy. And the religious boy, in, you know, in the same shkuna, in the same neighborhood, invited the, his non-religious friend to come see what a yeshiva is all about, what a Jewish school, a real Jewish school is all about. He loved it so much, the non-religious boy, that he stayed. He stayed and continued to learn. When the, when the father, non-religious father, found out where his son is, many of the Jews in Israel, unfortunately, the secular Jews, their attitude towards uh, Orthodox Jews is they're brainwashed. And what they're trying to do is brainwash others. So that he very much was very upset that his son was now being brainwashed by these black hats, Orthodox Jews. And he went to complain to the Rosh Yeshiva. He says, I don't want my son here. So he, the Rosh Hashiva tells the father, your son is happy, leave him alone. What do you want from him? He says, I don't want it. So they argued, they argued, they argued. The father couldn't get anywhere, so the father went to the police. He says, they're kidnapping my son. They're brainwashing him. I don't want this for my son. So the police chief calls the Rosh Hashiva and, the, and he asks for an explanation. Why are you holding this child against the will of the father? The father doesn't want this kind of a lifestyle. He doesn't want this kind of education for his son. So the rabbi tells the, the police and tells the father who's in front, listen, I'm not doing anything. The son is doing to the father exactly what the father did to his father. The father rebelled against his father, and now it's the turn of the son to rebel against his father. That's all. I didn't do anything. The father, mister, you rebelled against your father, and now your son is rebelling against you. He's going back to the original tradition. The boy remained, I think, in the yeshiva, did complete yeshiva, I don't know eventually what happened to the parents, but I wouldn't be surprised at all that the parents did Teshuvah. Because that is exactly what is happening. And there's another story that basically shows the same thing, that the children are bringing back their parents. There was a couple who were totally non-religious. They needed to move. They moved to a, a more religious neighborhood. As a result of their move, they needed to put the girl in some other school. The only school available in their new neighborhood was more observant school. So the little girl, I think, who was four years old, give or take a year, was going to a observant gun, like a nursery. You know what they teach girls on Friday? Light candles. And that's what she learned. She comes home one day, and mommy, lamat lo madlika nerot. Why don't you light candles? So the typical Israeli chutzpah mother tells her son, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> don't, you know, that's her first reactions. 
poor little girl. Anyway, she just asked a simple question, but anyway. One day, the little girl comes home and she and tells her mother, Mommy, if you don't light candles, I'm going to light candles. Shelota easy, she tells her daughter. Don't dare do that. <laughs> Another Israeli reaction, don't dare do that. <laughs> but the little girl, I guess the Israeli children are, Baruch Hashem, very strong. She didn't give up. She went down to the Makole, to the grocery store, and she asked for two candles. Now, the grocery man sees a girl coming for candles. He didn't understand what candles she needs and what she wants it for. So he gave her some yardside candles. All right. <laughs> so she comes up and she takes the two yardside candles to her room and she lights them. The mother opens the door and says, Maze, what's this? Another Israeli way of asking things. You know, what's this? And the little girl says, it's one for you and one for daddy. <laughs> as soon as she heard that answer with the yardside candles, one for her and one yardside candle for her husband, she began to cry. This is a woman who comes from, I think, from a Moroccan family. It was very close to her heart. She understood what Nero Shabbat were. She knows what yardside candles are too. And she began to cry. She only then realized that her daughter was really right in what she was doing. And what do you think happened? The parents today are completely observant, complete Balei Teshuvah, as a result of this little girl bringing them back through the candles of Shabbat. Many, many such stories, I'm telling you, many, many such stories of a tremendous revolution that is happening today in Israel, a revolution of Teshuvah. We say in Erev Shabbat, itna'ari me'afar kumi, bifshi b'kteh tifartech. Remove all the dust from you and get up. Itna'ari me'afar kumi. The children today are picking up from the dust what the parents threw away. There were, unfortunately, Jews who came to Ellis Island. Is that what it's called there in New York? And before they arrived in the port, they threw overboard, they threw their tefillin. We don't need it in America. I heard that women threw their wigs. Incredible. I mean, we, we can't judge them. We don't know what they went through. But nevertheless, they just threw. They threw it away. Their children are picking it back up. They're picking it up from the dust. The Midrash tells us that the Jews will be doing teshuvah Mir'ah, in a sense, before Mashiach comes. But Sarlecha, In other words, they will be fearful. And we said before that the real way to do Teshuvah will be Me'ahava. What is a form of Teshuvah Me'ahava? Is to search for the truth, and when you find it, to do something with it. The Midrash says this is exactly what should have happened in Churban Bayit Rishon. In the destruction of the Temple, when the Jews were exiled, they were crying on their way into exile. In Miao Navi said, had you cried, not now, had you cried before the destruction, you wouldn't have been exiled. All you needed to do was cry a little bit before, not later when it's late. Hashem accepts our Teshuvah too now, even though it's late, even though it's almost Mashiach is around the corner, even though things are not going to be so pleasant, of course the Teshuvah Miyad is acceptable. But had we cried before, before it would be too late, that would have been much preferable. In the same way the Zohar says a person's Teshuvah is much more acceptable if he doesn't want his young. Now when he's old and he does not have, the Yetzirah is not as powerful anymore. When you're young and you have all the temptations and all the challenges, and then you keep your Shabbat, you're observant despite all the difficulties, that deserves a lot, of, a lot more credit than one who does it later on in his life. But what, hap- what kind of Teshuvah did we do in Egypt? Also, mitok ne'aka. Vatar shamatam el Hashem. They were in pain. They were suffering. They were working very, very hard. They had no rest. Right? They were being persecuted, enslaved. And therefore, they cried out to Hashem. Hashem says, you know what? Better than nothing. And that is, as I, as I mentioned before, the Rambam says, in the end, everybody or the majority of Jews will do Teshuvah. The question is how and at what stage? Obviously, if, if everybody would do Teshuvah Mi'ahava, if everybody would do it as a result of finding out the truth, then we, we wouldn't have to suffer so much. We wouldn't have to have so many wars. So again, I want to emphasize, a lot of people are very close to Teshuvah. To, 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 to Teshuvah Mi'ahava, on their own, without pain, it's only that they push it off. They come up with excuses to push it off when they know already the truth. They see that all their friends... I mean, imagine you're living in Israel today. You are a successful banker. And you see that all your, you see a couple of your banker friends, not some hippie, not some criminal who was a mafia, who was a thief doing Teshuvah. Who are you seeing doing Teshuvah? You're seeing the elite of the elite. You're seeing, uh, I don't know, politicians movie stars, successful lawyers, and, and I'm telling you, that's exactly what you see today. The whole gamut is that we, of, uh, of people on all levels, in all careers, are doing Teshuvah. What is that? Yeah, is a, is a typical example. But there's ma- there are many people 
who are perhaps even more intellectual than him. You know, he's more in the movies, so they might claim, oh, he's not an intellectual, even though he's a smart man. But what about all the intellectuals? What about scientists? So if one were to look around, it says, if they are so smart, they're not sp stupid, and they're not desperate. They have money. They're not going through any hardships. If they're doing Teshuvah, why should I push it off? The reason, again, people are pushing it off is because either they're uncomfortable with it, or they have some other excuse. And when things get tough, they will have no choice. It will not be the same anymore. Hashem is making a birur, and He will see who is sincere or not through all the challenges that will come, will come to this generation. Professor Schwartz was teaching about science in the yeah. Right. And he looked into the, the atom. Uh -huh. the, the, the shape of Morgan David. Yeah, sure. Channel. Yeah, a lot of people have come to Teshuvah through all sorts of ways, but what they all have in common is that they're open-minded to the truth. And I may have mentioned it before, but the only way to find the truth is by learning Torah. I mean, obviously we see things that make sense. We see that there is a design to the world. It makes sense, but still, we need to investigate this further. The only way you can reach conclusions is when you open up the Torah and you see, oh, this is what the Torah already said, this is what the Torah expects of me. One has to learn Torah in order to get to the truth. How do we explain then, Rabbi, uh, what you said earlier in the, uh, the shir about the, uh, the Arab Rav coming from Rebbeim? If Rebbeim are learning Torah, how would they possibly be Arab Rav? Because they personally are opening up the Sefer, they're opening up... No, one thing has not to, nothing to do with it. Maybe you didn't understand me. I didn't mean to say that somebody who's an Erev Rav is not welcome to Olam Abba or anything like that. Erev Rav is just the root of the soul of the individual. And because of the root of his soul, he has certain qualities that will, will stand out. Nevertheless, if a Goy can convert to Judaism, an Erev Rav can also do Teshuvah and become a full-fledged Jew. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, with that. You know, there, there will be, hopefully, people from the Erev Rav who will join us. You know, but Hashem still has to filter out the ones who are insincere from the ones who are more sincere. Those who are Erev Rav, of course, will be filtered out. I don't know if all of them will, but a good number of them. Yeah. No, they're not. Now, this is a very important point, what I just said about the truth. The truth can only be found through the Torah. Those who are open-minded will search for the truth, will come to Teshuvah through the truth. But this will be a very, very difficult challenge to get to the truth. Not only because people have hesitations, not only because people postpone and push off things, but for another reason. The Torah, the rabbis tell us in the Gemara, Shahemet yene truth will be lacking. In the generation of Mashiach, when people are supposed to look for truth, it will be lacking, it won't be around. Everybody will claim to know the truth. You will have so many religions and so many cults. Just look at Christianity. There's so many types and brands. I don't even want to mention all the names. But you know what I mean. Cults of all kinds. And there's science too on top of this. So how do you know what the truth is? So of course you need to learn the Torah to, to come to the truth. But there's something else. Truth is lacking because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is about to create a new world. And before you create something brand new, the Maral Miprak says you destroy what was there before. Right? You demolish the home before you build a new world. Hashem is about to build a new world, basically. So everything else is, needs to be demolished. So what's going to be demolished? All what people have thought to be true. All the isms, communism, socialism, democracy, all of these things are going to be demolished. Hashem will show that they have no success whatsoever. That's not the recipe for success. That is not what will bring the world together. That is not what would, will make people happy. So Hashem is demolishing everything that is untrue. Emet is lacking. Truth is lacking. And when truth is lacking, things fall apart on their own. On their own. That is why marriages, many marriages are falling apart, because they're not built on a solid foundation of truth. They're selfish. People are more interested in themselves today, and therefore they're not willing to compromise, not willing to sacrifice, all because truth is lacking. Because truth is lacking, that is why things fall apart on their own. But as the Maral says, Hashem will also demolish all the things that many people think to be true, and in reality they're completely false. Anyone, anybody who learns Torah will find that the Torah will introduce him to the truth, and it will be to him like a blood transfusion. You know what a blood transfusion is? Sometimes people's blood is contaminated. The only way to save their life is through a blood transfusion. And that is what the Torah will do to any individual, any Jew, that brings himself to learn Torah, no matter what his head was, was in his head before, it will come out with the truth. The truth will drive away that which is false, like light drives away darkness.
last few minutes, I want to just spend on the signs that we see today that the Teshuvah revolution is really at its height. I mentioned before the Kibbutz Galuyot, the ingathering of the diaspora, is a clear sign, not only that something is about to happen, but that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking forward to greeting us. Because Kibbutz Galuyot not only is a fulfillment of the, one of the prophecies, that they will all come back, but it shows that Hashem loves us. If Hashem wouldn't love us, Chaz Shalom, He wouldn't allow this to happen. He wouldn't allow this to, to begin to take shape. So the fact that we are seeing Kibbutz Galuyot is not only an indication that we're close, it's, it also demonstrates that Hashem is happy with us. I mean, even though He's upset about certain things, but He's finally realizing that the time is up. I have to bring home my kids. And, of course, He's allowing this to happen. To happen in a, in a very smooth way, even though there are wars and there are some hurdles and obstacles, but relatively is allowing to, this to happen through permission of the nations, the United Nations. Why? Because Hashem basically says, I'm keeping my promise. And I love you, and the time has come, and therefore I'm making this happen. So this is, a, Kibbutz Galuyot is also a sign, not only of the imminent redemption, but that Hashem very much loves us. The land is giving fruit, Eretz Israel is giving fruit. It never gave fruit to any other nation. The land was desolate and barren, and nobody was successful in making anything grow, not even tomatoes. Today, the Jews in Israel not only succeeded in growing tomatoes, but they did it in a hydrophonic way. Is that the way they call it? In water, not in earth. Growing in water. In many ways that, the, that nobody else was able to figure out how to do. They have had tremendous success in the area of agriculture, which is another sign which the prophets talk about, that not only Mashiach is coming, but Hashem says, these are my kids, I love them, let me give them all the fruits. They are welcome, not nobody else is. For them I will give the fruits. I mean, that is a positive sign. Yeah. What is that? The what? Yeah, sure, sure. Then you have, of course, the Siksug, the prospering of the Yeshivot, in the most remote places in Israel, there was a lot of destruction in Poland and in Europe. All the yeshivot are being rebuilt. There's a lot of places of Torah, new mikvaot, new yeshivot, new kolelim. In many places, that is, a sign. that is also a positive sign. But Hashem, of course, is allowing and enabling this to happen. And of course, He's very happy that there's more and more Torah reaching all the corners and even into some kibbutzim that were die-hard socialists and communists only a few years ago. And finally, we have the prophecy of Bebechi, Yavou, Betachanunim, Ovilem, that the Jewish people will come back to Israel through cries and through tears and through supplications. That means that they will not have it easy. The simple meaning of that pasuk is that they will come after many, many years of suffering, after a Holocaust. That is how they will come. And I once asked a question, but wait a minute. It says, that you will come to Israel with joy. You will leave the diaspora with tremendous happiness doesn't talk about the pain. It won't be so difficult. How do you reconcile the two Pesukim? The way you can understand Bechi with Tachanunim is that these will be cries of Teshuvah. It does not necessarily have to be cries of fear, cries of war, cries of suffering. In other words, the Navi is saying, it's going to be through cries, it's going to be through tears that you're going to shed. But you're going to shed as a result of what? As a result of Teshuvah Mi'ahava or Teshuvah Mi'ira'ah. You will cry and you will beg Hashem. You will be desperate. That's Teshuvah Mi'ira'ah. Or will you do it on your own? You will cry to Hashem, please forgive us. Please forgive us sins. We want to come back to you. That can also be tears. That can be tears of Teshuvah Mi'ahava. That is, of course, what Hashem is waiting for us to do. If that, of course, happens, which is happening, then we will, of course, be Zochet to Kibbe Simchat Etzehu Uve Shalom Tuvalun. Then we will be able to come, you know, and meet up with Mashiach with joy and happiness without any more suffering. I just want to end with what Rabbi Rav Yitzhak Mibadichev used to say before Rosh Hashanah, that Ribbono Shel Olam, Am Yisrael already blew so many shofarot. So many shofarot, so many Rosh Hashanah, we blew so many times shofarot to call out to you. So many times, now it's your turn to only just blow once. And that is the blowing of the shofar of Eliyahu Navi that we're all waiting for. That of course will, will signal and will herald the coming of the Mashiach, Bezat Hashem, very soon. Before we leave, I just want to repeat a little point that I mentioned before. I just want to repeat a little point that I said before about the children. The children will have a tremendous part in the Geulah. Rabbi tells us the women will also have a part in the Geulah. All Jews will have some part in the Geulah. 
The reason there is an emphasis on the children, children bringing back the parents is for the following reason too. There was once a father and a son who were traveling on a long journey. The father was always helping his little boy, carrying him, helping him, assisting him in any way possible. The father had to take care of his child. They finally reached their destination and there's a big wall. It's late at night, the father can't get in. But he sees a small little window. He says, you know what? Now it's your turn to help me. Because you can fit into that window and you can open up the door on the other side. Many times adults have a hard time helping themselves, doing Teshuvah. And it's through the temimut, the sincerity of their children who are learning Torah in a Jewish Orthodox school. It is through their sincerity, their zechut and their prayers that we as adults are helped. We will be helped tremendously from children who are learning in Jewish schools. It's a tremendous avon, tremendous sin, that so many Jewish children are in public schools just because their parents want to save money. They don't realize the help that they can get from children who are learning Torah, Bikdushah with Tahara, with purity. They are sincere, they are tmimim. They will, therefore, they will have a tremendous part, a tremendous chilek in bringing about the gula. We may have to turn to them. Here we're helping our kids, but we may need their help when it comes to the final prayers of Rosh Hashanah, of Yom Kippur. On our own, we may not be able to do it. But if we have invested in our children that they receive the proper education, it could be through their zechut and through their tefillot, the parents will also be saved. The parents will also be teshuvah, do teshuvah as we've seen before and as we're seeing in Eretz Israel. Many families are doing teshuvah because of the children. So this is a tremendous idea that we have to share with all of those that we know, all of the Jews that we know, that underestimate the value of the education, Jewish education of one's children, that the future of them Remaining as Jews depends on this, and the future of the entire family depends. It could be just one child. If he spends his school years in a Jewish school, in a good Jewish school, that investment will pay off because the entire family of Ezzat Hashem will do Teshuvah. And the more such families do Teshuvah, the more such children bring back their parents, the closer we will be to the Geulah. But it's not only closer to the Geulah, it's that the Geulah will have a completely different face. It will be a Geulah mitoch ahava, not mitoch yira. With other shame, we will not have to undergo all the threats and all the fear and all the wars that the Midrash and the Prophet say may happen. It is up to us. In other words, we have the ultimate decision to make on how we want this to come about. And with other shame, I really hope that we've suffered enough, like the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, all the hard times and all the terrible wars are behind us in World War I and World War II. And with other shame, what's, comes, what's coming next is only happiness and only good news. And with other shame, we should all be so to a Hatimatova. Shana Tova, Vigeula Kerova, Amen.